Well, the mainstream narrative would suggest NATO forces are now stepping up efforts to protect civilians in the strategic city of Misrata, Libya. That an interrogation of Egypt's deposed Hosni Mubarak brings Egyptians new hope. But in the midst of the so called Arab Spring, is it democracy and humanitarian aid blossoming or instability? U.S. foreign policy follies, an anti-American insurgency. Well, my next guest may be able to shed a lot of light. I'm joined by former CIA intelligence officer. He's also former chief of the CIA's bin Laden unit, and he's also the author of many books. His most recent including, or his most recent is, Osama bin Laden. Michael Schuer is our guest joining us now. I want to thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Yeah, I want to start with, sir, kind of the most recent developments. We hear from the Pentagon that the U.S. is continuing to lead airstrikes in Libya after the Obama administration has tri had tried to distance itself, saying that NATO is in charge of this operation. Should we be surprised, or has uh, the U.S., you know, Obama administration just done a, done a good job of having a PR effort that... I think it's mostly a PR effort. Uh, you know, mo most of the world knows that NATO doesn't do anything without U.S. direction and U.S. management, and that clearly is the case. We're trying, I think what we're trying to do is just fool the Muslim world that it's the Brits and the French and the other Europeans who are bombing uh, Gaddafi. But uh, I think the Muslim world is much smarter than that, and they know that the Uni United States is behind the, the, uh, the offensive. What do you think is the problem with that? Well, the problem is that is our reputation in the Muslim world is, is attacking Muslim countries that have oil. And it's certainly the case that uh, Libya is a Muslim country and a country that has oil. So uh, we're making things worse for ourselves. Indeed, we're confirming what Osama bin Laden has been saying about the United States for the past 15 years. If that's the case, uh, you know, if we're not fooling the Muslim world, uh, it does seem that we may be fooling the media world in the United States. I've watched some of your interviews, several of your interviews uh, on mainstream U.S. media channels, and it seems that anchors are very, very surprised with uh, the analysis that you give. But you're not the only person that has said things like this. You know, Secretary Gates uh, initially said it would be a bad idea to get involved in Libya. Um, when you talk about the involvement of uh, the U.S. relationship with Israel, in the Arab world. I mean, that's something that Petraeus, General Petraeus has spoken about. So why do you think these things come, to such a, come as such a surprise to the media? I think part of it is because our education system in the United States is so terrible. Uh, the, the media went to Tahrir Square, Square in Cairo and it, it interviewed a few dozen well-groomed, middle-class, educated Muslims who could speak English and talk about democracy. And they read the writings of those same people on Twitter and on Facebook. And they extrapolated that small sample to 80 million Egyptians and called it democracy on the march. Well, more than half of Egypt is illiterate. And they're moving in the direction of Islam. They're not moving in the direction of secular democracy, which is regarded in the Muslim world very widely as almost a, a pagan religion. Why is it bad if they're moving towards Islam? It's not bad. I don't, I, I don't think it's, very, it's a very useful situation for the United States, but ultimately that's up to them where they move. Uh, but the, what, what President Obama, uh, uh, Sarkozy, Prime Minister Cameron, what they're trying to do is to sort of fool their people that somehow we're going to have democracies that are peaceful in the Middle East after these tyrannies are gone. What do you think is going to be the case? I think we're going to have weaker governments, first of all. We're going to have governments that have not a lot of use for the United States because the people are going to remember that the United States and its allies supported tyranny in the Middle East for the last 50 years. What about the argument some people say that, you know, for example, in Libya, the United States is there to try and set up a puppet government that is more sympathetic to the U.S., more sympathetic to U.S. interests, unlike Gaddafi, which you know, Western leaders would regard as not quite being so subordinate, although I know he did help in the war on terror. Gaddafi was an extremely valuable ally for the United States in terms of our number one enemy, which was Al-Qaeda and its allies, just like Saddam was. Although we didn't talk to Saddam, as long as Saddam was in favor, the, the Mujahideen were not coming out of South Asia and the Persian Gulf toward the Levant. So why has the U.S. so quickly turned on him? Is oil more important now than Al-Qaeda? I'm not sure if it's oil. I think we have the last four presidents we've had in the United States have really seen the world that they want. And they want a democratic, peaceful, humanitarian world, which is a great aspiration. But not, they don't have many contact points with reality. But democratic, peaceful world, uh, it doesn't seem like that's the goal that the United States is trying to accomplish in Libya. It's, it's hard to see what we're trying to accomplish in Libya because we're supporting um, if, the, if the men who were in the resistance in Libya were in Afghanistan, they would be the Taliban. 
So we're supporting, uh, basically, we're providing air cover for, for people who are, may not be Al-Qaeda, but are fighting for the same reasons. You know, in 2009... What are those reasons? The reasons are to dump Gaddafi and to establish a government that is an Islamic government and which will uh, fight against the United States, its allies, and Israel. How do you know? Well, the United States government told us in 2009. They published a report, widely distributed, that Miserata and, and Benghazi were the heart of Islamist activities in, uh, in Libya. That's where the resistance is. Those are the, they sent the second highest number of suicide bombers of any country on earth to Iraq, for example. So it's not rocket science. If it was, it couldn't come from me. Well, so then why, I mean, if you have this knowledge and you were, you know, formerly the voice in the president's ear, the secretary of state defense's ear, isn't there someone like you on the inside saying these things to the president? Oh, absolutely. But they, the presidents don't care. Since Ronald Reagan, each president that, that I worked for, and I didn't work for Mr. Obama, but Mr., the first Mr. Bush, Mr. Clinton, and uh, the second Mr. Bush, they care less and less about what intelligence says. They're going to be citizens of the world. They're going to bring democracy to people, even though those people will fight it to the death. So intelligence, it can be very good, but unless it's used and respected, it's, it's really useless. Let's talk about more uh, broadly about the Arab Spring, because one area that you've written about, one country you've written about, is Syria. Yes. Uh, and that's one nation that's a little bit more similar to Libya in its relations to the United States. And some U.S. leaders uh, would very well like a more sympathetic government. And some members of Congress have even called for the use of force in Syria. But you argue that a different government would lead to more instability and would actually be worse for the United States states worse for Israel why it's not going to be as powerful as as Assad's government it's going to be more influenced by uh, Islamists uh, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria or other groups Assad uh, the old man the father tried to co-opt the Islamists and opened enormous numbers of mosques and schools in, in universities and they're now a very powerful movement in Syria and in terms of US interests our interests are best served uh, by Assad being just where he is. In fact, what we're seeing, and it's a very odd situation, is the United States government cheering on the destruction of tyrannies that uh, are necessary to maintain Israel's security. Also to maintain uh, oil, uh, oil uh, resources to transport oil. Yes. It, across the region. We are seeing the collapse of a 30-year-old U.S. strategic policy. We depended on tyranny for easy access to, regular, to, to relatively inexpensive oil. We depended on tyrannies uh, to protect the Israelis. And we depended on tyr tyrannies to pro persecute, prosecute, and incarcerate Islamists. Well, what other alternative is there? Because I know you've been critical of the United States propping up those tyrannies, but it sounds like you're saying that the alternative is worse. And that's what the U.S. has, you know, taken a stand in in some yeah. of those countries. What, so. what I would argue is that backing tyranny was wrong from the start, but Mr. Obama has a habit of getting off of one horse without another horse to get onto. And ultimately, the bottom line is, how do we protect the United States best? How do we? Well, either you support those tyrannies, which is probably a bad idea. It's what it's continuing to do in Bahrain, though. Well, that's a, I think Bahrain is a separate, a separate issue. Mm -hmm. I, I think the best thing for the United States is to back away and let the cards fall where they may. If Israel disappears, if Palestine disappears, who cares? It doesn't matter to the United States in terms of uh, uh, any kind of interests or, 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 or energy or anything else. How does it not matter in terms of oil? How does it not matter in terms of what your bailiwick and your kind of real uh, area of expertise is, which is uh, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism with al-Qaeda? How would that not matter to the U.S.? Well, it, 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 of course it does matter. We're going to have to take care of that of ourselves. But we've been, we've been very childish in our approach to it already. We've depended on Saleh in Yemen. We depended on Musharraf in Pakistan. None of that's worked. Out. Ultimately, if we're going to defeat the Islamists, it's going to, be have, it's going to have to be done by U.S. military power. Isn't and that what we're doing? Hardly. If, if the world thinks that they've seen the amount of power and destruction that can be exerted by the U.S. military, they're sadly mistaken. But why should they? Because doesn't that breed the kind of anti-American sentiment about U.S. foreign policy that you say is fueling al-Qaeda? Uh, nobody likes to get bombed. But if you, that's all you have to, do, to, to use, you have to defend your country. You know, I'm very sure the Germans didn't like the fact that we were, we were bombing the hell out of them in World War II, but ultimately it worked. And the best, uh, and, 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 and as long as the United States 
and its allies are dependent on Persian Gulf oil, we're going to be fighting in that region. So until the United States breaks the oil habit, we're, we're stuck there, and we're going to have to fight. That's, and, that's and, not likely to happen. No, and that's where the next war is going to come. The next war is going to come in Bahrain. Do you think that the United States is fighting a proxy war there right now, utilizing Saudi Arabia uh, against Iran? I think just the opposite. Really? I think, what's the, you know, I, I think the Obama administration is frightened to death about what's happening in Bahrain. The Saudis and their partners, the Sunni governments and the Gulf Cooperation Council, have decided they're not going to permit a Shia government on the peninsula, which would, which would happen in Bahrain if, if people were given a choice. The Saudis and their, their partners will kill as many Shias as, it's, as is necessary to maintain the Sunni monarchy in Bahrain. The question will come down to, as those Shias are being killed, what will the Iranians do? Will they stand back and let that slaughter occur, or will they intervene? If they intervene, the United States will go to war. Because the Saudis, although they buy billions and billions of dollars of U.S. arms, they can't defend themselves. And the United States depends on Saudi oil, and it depends on the Gulf countries buying our debt. So we don't have a choice. Uh, to me, Bahrain is the single most dangerous point in the Middle East right now. Should people be paying more attention to that as opposed to Libya? Are we, again, uh, displacing our uh, resources in Libya when we should be focused on something yeah. else? And when I say we, I mean the United States yeah. government. Libya is a nonsense. Um, if they're really concerned about humanitarian aid or a humanitarian situation, if, they, if NATO had not intervened, that war would be over. Nobody would be getting killed at the moment. Now it appears to be an endless war. But in terms of U.S. interests, Bahrain is really the dangerous thing. It's like August 1914. The Iranians don't want a war there. The Saudis don't want a war there. The Americans don't want a war there. But it has a momentum of its own if the Shia keep demonstrating. Do you think anybody, I don't know who you still speak to in the CIA, in the Obama administration, is anybody talking about that on the inside in the way that you are? I don't know if that, yes, I would imagine that they were because it's not rocket science. It's there for you to see. It's not going to be a surprise when it happens. Do you still talk to people, though? Do you know if that's on the radar in the way that you're talking about it? I, I talk to very few people, but the, people, the few people that I do talk to, it's clearly a, a, a very strong concern because we don't have any troops left. That's the problem. Where are the troops going to come from? If they come from Iraq, sectarian violence goes up there. If they come from Afghanistan, uh, we lose even quicker to the Taliban. We're going to have to bring them from Korea or from Germany? I don't know. But the problem for the United States is we don't have a choice. We have to fight there if, worse, if the worst situation comes. And uh, get spread even more and more thin with well, a loaded military budget and a deficit and debt that's Well, really for Obama, it would mean conscription. It would have, you would have to restore the draft in the United States in order to put enough people into the military to eventually fight all these wars. But then at least it would get them maybe on the radar of American public, which seems so removed from them. I want to thank you so much You're for welcome. your analysis of all of this that's going on. Thank that you. was former CIA intelligence officer Michael Shewer.